Welcome to the Shooting the Cue podcast, presented by Heat Riles Barbecue, with tips, tricks, and an inside look with some of the top pitmasters in the game. Now here's your host, Heath Riles. All right, folks, today we are lucky enough to be joined by the one and only Gabriel Gator Gilbo. How are you doing today, Gator? I'm doing real well, man. It's finally cooled off down here in Texas, so we're, we're enjoying a normal person summer now. <laughs> Nothing wrong with that. So for everybody that don't know you, can you tell everybody kind of a little bit about yourself and, and everything you got going on? Well, I'm um, a very much not traditionally trained cook and chef. <laughs> uh, I've spent almost no time in the restaurant business. I, uh, I didn't go to school. Um, I went to regular school, but I, I wasn't there much either. But uh, <laughs> Uh, I've been cooking professionally now for over 15 years uh, for film and television productions across the country. Uh, I've worked on the the smallest and worst movies and the biggest and best movies, and same goes for television shows. And uh, in the last several years, I got hooked up with a TV show called Yellowstone that if anybody who doesn't live under a rock knows about now, and I've uh, been very fortunate enough to have a great time there and meet some great people and, uh, of course, be on the show as well, playing a character based off myself called Gator, who is me. You know, that's always good when you can wind up playing yourself. Um, I was lucky enough I got sent to Hollywood for a commercial for Bank of America, and we couldn't use my name. Uh, which was kind of disheartening at the time, but you're very fortunate to have used your name and your brand likeness. Uh, that I do think that's pretty cool uh, in our world that we live in, being a cook, you know. Yeah, as long as Paramount doesn't physically brand me, I should be fine. That's right. <laughs> that's right. Well, so um, tell us a little bit about your new cookbook. How did What inspired you to honestly write a cookbook in the first place? Uh, a cookbook has been something that we've talked about over the last several years. Um, I had a lot of friends reach out often, and I had a lot of colleagues always asking for recipes of things that I had cooked for them on set and things that I, they particularly liked or that they wanted to make for their family. So a cookbook has been kind of a looming uh, deal over the last several years. And as the, my popularity with Yellowstone grew and my, my fandom, and uh, obviously a huge uh, part of it has been this Yellowstone marketing campaign that we've been on for the last several months or year. Or, um, obviously, you can't walk down the street without seeing a Yellowstone t-shirt. Everybody knows that. So I was approached uh, about a year and a half ago or more by one of our producers, the head of 101 Studios, David. And we were sitting, you know, sitting, having dinner somewhere, drinking wine. And he said, you know, we're, we're going to do a book, you know, we're going to do a cookbook. And I said, oh, that's, that's great, man. And, you know, I normally try not to get too involved in producer conversations because they get a little hot. <laughs> but uh, I said, yeah, man, that's great. Sounds cool. He goes, well, would you would you want to do the book? Would you want to be the author of the cookbook? And I said, well, now, David, don't you think it'd be a little strange if I didn't author the cookbook of Yellowstone? And he goes, well, yeah, you know what? That would be really weird. I said, great, so I'll do the cookbook, man. Uh, and uh, obviously, I'm, I'm so glad I did, and it's been an amazing experience. Uh, it has not been easy, or, or, or uh, it's... It hasn't been all the fun, but it, it's been a really nice experience. Well, I have to ask. I'm going to kind of jump around here a minute since we're talking about the cookbook. I have already found a recipe that I'm going to have to try to duplicate coming up for Thanksgiving, which is your uh, sweet potato bourbon pie. Yeah, that seems like so, it's right up your alley, buddy. <laughs> it, it, it does. And so have you ever cooked it on a smoker? That's my question to you. I have not, but I'm sure it would go really well. Um, obviously, you're you're pretty seasoned on the on the pit, so you you know to just be cautious of the sweets can can get overwhelmed by the smoke. That's right. And uh, we've been fortunate. I wonder if you couldn't like cold smoke it or or go real low and then 
or finish it in the oven or vice versa, you know, par bake it in the oven and then finish it in the smoker. Yeah, I might try that. We done a uh we've done cheesecakes and also pecan pies on the smoker. A pecan pie. And now we've done it on a stick it. burner and we've done it on a pellet grill. And I will tell you doing it on a pellet grill with the right pellets, it seems like uh, if you know in the oven you have to you get your pie out and you have to cover it with a with a ring around the crust or or usually some foil sometimes because it gets a little dark on you. On that pellet grill, it never does that for some odd reason. It just always bakes out a hundred percent. Different heat source or something. Light kiss of smoke. Um, it turns out really well for the pecan pies that we've done. So I've got to ask, what is your favorite dish in the book? That that keeps that gets harder and harder to answer every time somebody a asks that question. Um, the problem is, is all of those dishes are my favorite dishes. So, <laughs> like. The most, I'd say 85 to 90 percent of the, the recipes in there are recipes that I've been cooking for film and television crews and family and friends for as long as I can remember. Um, so they all they all have a very, very special meaning to me. Um, you know, I have cooked so much chicken and dumplings. I've cooked more chicken and dumplings. You wouldn't you couldn't believe me when I tell you how many chicken and dumplings I've cooked. The answer is, which one do I enjoy eating? Uh, that, that one's up there. Chicken and dumplings is up there. <laughs> well, you kind of answered my question. I was going to ask you, did you have to make specific recipes just to kind of cater to the Yellowstone lifestyle and film? But so you're saying that most of these recipes you've already been doing and you were able, they kind of just fit right in, really. I certainly did. Uh, no, Yellowstone and I were fated to be be together. We were always yeah. meant to be a part of each other's lives, and um, Yellowstone, as a as a production, is is a living, breathing animal. You know, it's it's alive, and um, me me and Yellowstone just synced up right away. We we made sense for each other, and uh, I had been doing this type of cooking for years for people all across the country, and it was nice to finally cook for my people. You know. So since you got put into the acting role, is that something that you want to keep doing or is that just a, a Yellowstone only thing since you guys fit so well together? Well, I'm not a very good actor, but uh, I guess <laughs> I don't screw it up too bad often. Uh, no, you know, I'm, I'm open to whatever. I think I've never really had a, a plan and I don't think I'm going to start having one now. So if, if it, if it comes up, yeah, I'll act more. I'll go play whoever you want. Um, but I certainly uh, enjoy doing more unscripted stuff personally. Yeah. I, I feel like I'm better at it. And um, what better, you know, you already have the perfect character. Just use me, you know? That's right. So I've got to ask, you launched your own... Um, food processing company, I guess, along the way to start making some products, your hot sauce. Is that correct? I did. Yeah. Um, so we'd really like to start. Um, I, I got into making hot sauces a few years ago. Uh, I found that there was, and I know like every, everybody's got their seasoning out. You've got a huge line of seasoning. I see them everywhere. Everybody on my feed is always using your stuff. Um, but uh, I found a real lack in the world for, for good hot sauces. I found a lot of sauces that were just spicy or underflavored or boring. I mean, uh, how many bottles of Crystal and Tabasco I've gone through in my life, you don't understand. But, but I, I, I found a lack. I found a need for, for a more flavor-forward hot sauces. So I started making these, and especially when we started having sriracha crises a few years ago, which we all suffered for. Yes. Um, I started making all my own hot sauces. So we're in the process still of, of getting a full launch out on that. It's, I've obviously been very busy because I still have to do my, my regular labor job and I have the cookbook that's been insane. Um, so I'm, I'm really going to try and uh, into next year really launch again with the hot sauce. I, I sell some bottles, but um, we'd really like to go, to go bigger. Anything we can do to help you. I mean, but I know I you've got a huge platform. A, I do make an incredibly delicious hot sauce that uh, 
I've got some I can send some over to you to try it. I would like to try it for sure. I'm a I'm an aficionado is what I like to say. Uh, my garage looks like a spice lab. I bet it does. Uh, <laughs> so many people send me products, and then I develop so many things, and a lot of companies reach out about me developing recipes for them, and it's uh, – it's turned into I should I almost need a full blown testing lab and we're honestly building right now a full on film kitchen and and podcast area and a forty by forty outdoor cooking space that's you know state of the art and grills and pits and uh, sounds like I need to come to your house, man. It, yeah, that's actually on our farm that we're building. We have a couple hundred acres and uh, and it'll be right up your alley. I'll say that uh, you know it'll be a lot of uh, shooting and I put in a a trap course I'm putting in some some sporting clays and so it'll be fun to be able to shoot and podcast and cook videos and all in one little spec there and stay so yeah yeah that was that was a, a plan at one point was just build a factory in the backyard and just start making hot sauce uh, so is it always gonna just not just be but always gonna be hot sauce or any uh, no we want to go of other stuff but personally for me that's yeah. where my passion lies um, gotcha. we, I'm totally about making all sorts of different products and, you know, buy my t-shirts, whatever, but, uh, definitely like the passion for me is going to be hot sauce. It, yeah. it's something that's been, uh, a part of my life for so long. And me and my daddy were big hot sauce guys. Me and my friends are big hot sauce people. Um, and it's, it's, it's funny because, <laughs> uh, I'm a chicken too. <laughs> when it comes to the heat. Uh, I used to be real good, but as I get older, I, it's, it's, it's hurts more, uh, but I'll eat it. Like I'll eat the spiciest stuff, but it, uh, it's get, gets harder and harder to eat the hot stuff, but all my, all my hot sauces are hot. Um, but none of them are going to kill nobody. <laughs> That's a good way to put it. <laughs> yeah. Make your nose run real good, right? Yeah. You're going to sweat, but you're going to like to sweat. <laughs> That's what I, that's the kind of flavor I like. I don't want nothing that I can't. I think it should always be flavor first, then spice. That's exactly right. I want to, all my, my spice blends are flavor forward. I want you to taste that pungent punch when you get them. It's uh, really is- tough because I, I do everything I can to use all fresh ingredients for when I make hot sauce. And uh, as, as you probably know, getting fresh peppers is, can be so difficult. Um, yes. I make a... Um, I make a, uh, a sriracha replacement called Fresno ketchup. It's probably one of the best sauces I've ever made. But I have been waiting for Fresno peppers for four months, and I haven't seen wow. one. So. Oh, wow. Wow. So you mentioned your father a second ago. Um, so reading in your book, that's part of where your cooking came from, right? Absolutely. Where it started. Uh, my daddy was uh, always associated with food service he 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 grew up in it and um growing up in south louisiana you're just around food all the time everybody's a cook and everybody eats all the time so he was uh, a manager at a local pizza shop at 14 years old in his hometown um they made him the gm at 14 which is (laughs) you know obviously crazy to people these days but back then if you were good you were good it didn't matter how old you were so, uh, and then he went on to, to do a bunch more restaurant stuff and uh, worked in New Orleans at some big restaurants, was managers there. He became a maitre d' at a hotel at one point, uh, opened his own restaurant in Louisiana, and then eventually made his way to California and, and got in the film industry uh, feeding people. And he had no idea what he was getting into or how to act appropriately on a movie set or anything. Uh, his, uh, the story always goes his first day on a movie set, he went and joined a, a fellow Kunas who was doing a, that t- type of work. And he showed up on his first day in a tuxedo with tails. And uh, everybody looked at him like, what, what, uh, what are you wearing there? And, and he looked around and saw all these, you know, grips and electricians and teamsters and they were all wearing cargo shorts and tool belts. And he said, <laughs> he thought to himself, man, I think I might have misjudged what I'm in for. And they all, this guy looked at him real funny and he said, what are you wearing, man? He goes, oh, um, you know, I just catered a wedding, so I got to go change in the truck. And he went and changed and, um, you know, the rest is kind of history. He he got in the business and started doing craft services like I do. And 
people really liked him. Uh, and the fact that he could make food just made it even better. Um, he, he, on one of his first TV shows that he was working on and kind of got the reins on, he ended up frying turkeys on a movie set in Los Angeles. And this was in like 94, 95, when no one had ever heard of a fried turkey before unless you'd been to the Texas State Fair. Wow. So it, it made was... a, I still have people tell me that story from back in the 90s. They're like, you know, there was this guy uh, one time, kind of like you, you know? He did the things that you do, like cooked in front of everyone, and he fried turkeys on set. It was, a big, it was the greatest thing I've ever seen. I was like, yeah, I know that guy. Uh, I, mean, I think I know who you're talking about. So is all of that through the SAG Actors Union that y'all that he started out at? Uh, no, kind of catering? definitely not. Definitely the SAG uh, SAG AFTRA is new to me. Um, I've only joined in the last couple of years. Um, my daddy was strictly behind the scenes and uh, freelance. Freelance, but we we've been union for a long time also. Uh, we're in a labor union. Um, I'm actually losing track of how many unions I've had to join. But <laughs> The reason I always ask that, I was a part of the SAG Actors Union when I shot those commercials for a while, and I thought it had great benefits and, and great things like that for somebody in that. That was many, many moons ago. My wife it, was still in nursing school. It does. If you can get enough hours in, you're, it's a good union to be in. Yes, for sure. No doubt. So talking about cooking, did your father teach you all the, the cooking that you have today? Or was it some influence from your mother and uh, grandparents as well? All around and a lot of failure. Uh, a lot, lot of failure. But um, I really got from my dad not so much. Some of the things I learned from him, some of the recipes are, are from him. Um, but really it's a mindset that I learned from my dad and that was how to serve food correctly and how to um, do it in the atmosphere that we do it in on a movie set and also learning how to feed film crews. They're very different. Um, they're, they're particular about the way things are laid out and the way that, the way that they eat and what they eat. So that was definitely a huge thing that I learned from him. And, but majorly was cooking on site like that with limited uh, equipment or limited ingredients. That's not something that you can learn in culinary school. You can't, and, and you can't learn it often in a, in a commercial kitchen, in a restaurant either, because you have your four walls and you have your station that's set up every day. And we just never had that. Um, it was only until like two years ago I finally built myself a huge like commercial kitchen. We call, call it the albatross. It's <laughs> sitting in my backyard. Um, it wasn't until then that I, I finally had like a full mobile commercial kitchen. And before that, we, we cooked guerrilla style. We, we, cooked, we set up tables and tents and burners and flat tops and we cooked outside. And I still do that. I mean, I'm in the same way. I have the big trailers too, but I still catch myself outside under a tent a lot. Uh, yeah, doing well, these the doing damn events. trailers don't fit everywhere. <laughs> it does not. I've, I've downsized, and I've had great big ones, 40 foot long, 42 foot long. You know, goose Look, I love, I love my 40 foot kitchen, but it does not fit everywhere. Sometimes you just no. got to bust out the. I, I throw it in the in the Kubota and try drive with a table and a burner and go make something up. That's right. I'm in the middle of building one now that'll fit in a parking place. That is my goal. A mobile. That's how I started. That's how I started. Trailer. One one truck that fits everywhere. That's right. I've got to ask this because we, Meta Creek Smokers, has been a longtime customer of ours. One of my very first people that picked me up when we come out with seasoning. So to see that you cook on a Meadow Creek, I mean, I've spoke with Melvin on the phone a dozen times. You were times. the first person to bring up Meadow Creek in a long time to me. Uh, in all my interviews, you're the first person to bring up a Meadow Creek, which that probably makes sense that you would. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me add, how do you like it? And how did you wind up choosing Meadow Creek in the first place? When I bought my first uh, kitchen truck uh, many years ago, uh, where I bought it from, uh, and it was just a Mac, an old Mac tool truck. It still had shag carpet in it. Like we, it was intended to be built. Um, where I bought it from in Alabama, there was 
a barbecue sitting nearby. And I had dabbled in barbecue in before that, but it was never something I did a lot because I just didn't have, I didn't have the equipment to do it. Um, I had played with some pellet smokers and stuff, but it was just never something, cause I didn't, I never cooked at home. I only cooked at work. So it was just not something I had in my arsenal. And when I bought that, my, my daddy was always a great influence on everything I did. And, and he helped guide me through my, my career. And he said, you, you need that, you need that smoker. And they had this, uh, it was a TS-250, um, just a bare bones model, man. But it had the, li it had the live smoke in the, in the chimney and then it had um, you know, the 250 gallon tank. But as you know, Meadow Creeks, they're, they're the top of the game, dude. Like there's not a better, there's not a better made smoker out there. And uh, I used the ever loving hell out of that Meadow Creek smoker, man. Um, and I smoked whole pigs on it and briskets and chicken and, and turkeys and everything you can imagine. I, I really got used to using the machine and, and I, I really love, uh, that primitive wood fire, uh, you know, using charcoal and lighter fluid just doesn't seem right to me. And I have, I've got buddies who, uh, you know, they've got some Southern prides, they build super fancy and, and I see the beauty in it. Like I love the push the button and then we go drink beer on the lake and then we come yeah. back and this briskets are ready, but it'll never be the same. Never taste the same. I don't never. care what they say. That traditional stick burner, you yep. cannot mimic that taste out of nope. any other smoker. It does not matter. And so that TS-250, uh, we were heading to Montana for, I think it was season three maybe season two. No. Yeah. Season two of Yellowstone. We were heading up to Montana and we used to commute back and forth from park city, Utah to Darby, Montana. That was our, that was our run when we go shoot in Montana. And I had a guy with me that we were in a caravan. I had, I think I had five trucks in my caravan of all my stuff I was bringing up there. And somehow the old boy ended up in the back of the, of the caravan. He was a little less experienced and, uh, I guess he kind of dozed off a little bit and the smoker flipped off the truck and rolled off into the ditch and disappeared. Um, oh, no. And we, pu we, pulled into, <laughs> we pulled into our, our next filling station and uh, <laughs> this dude pulls up in my pickup truck and I was like, that was really fast. Why is he driving so, oh, there's no barbecue pit behind him. And I said, hey man, wh when'd you lose the smoker? And he goes, what? what? What smoker? I was like, the, the barbecue pit that was behind you, when did you lose it? And he goes, oh, I don't know. I said, oh, God. So I sent, sent some of my guys back to go find the barbecue pit. Of course, it's the middle of the night. It's pitch black in Idaho. No, I mean, in 90 miles from anything. Up and down hills and winding. I've been all through there and was been lucky enough to have been up, uh, you know, all through. There. I fly out to Salt Lake City and been to Park City. Uh, Traegers out there, so we've been to their headquarters. I sent my brother. I sent my brother back to go recover the smoker, and they they were able to find like some chaos in the road. You could see some big gouges in the highway, and it was off on the side of the road. We went and got it back. I actually just uh, just this last season, I finally ended up in Salt Lake City, where I had stashed it in somebody's uh, yard. I stashed it at a buddy of mine's shop in the yard. And I, and I was happened to be in Park City and I had an empty truck with a trailer and I was like, man, let me come get that smoker, dude. I, I hadn't seen it in years and I actually just had it re rebuilt uh, this winter. So I'm, it's sitting in Montana ready to go back to work. But anyways, I ended up getting a TS-500 instead um, because I went to replace the Meadow Creek and um, found out how much those things cost. <laughs> uh, I, yeah. I wasn't aware I got such a good deal on my original one. Uh, I think I paid like 3,500 bucks for it or something, oh, which yeah. was amazing. And I went to go replace it. And I was like, holy smokes, these things are crazy expensive. Uh, and I, I shopped and shopped and shopped and looked around. I looked down here in Texas and Alabama and um, trying to find something comparable that was more in my price range. And... Uh, None of them felt good, man. I, I, I couldn't get in into it. it. It just, none of them were a Meadow Creek. 
Um, so I bought the most expensive Meadow Creek they make. <laughs> so did you and have I, to go to Pennsylvania to, to get it? I had to become a vendor. I had to, they wouldn't let me buy one. I had to come become a dealer. Oh wow! And then we dr we drove to Pennsylvania and and sat there at the shop and waited for him to finish. It was great because when I ordered it, uh, there was a few things that I didn't you know click in the box on the order sheet. Um, and those guys were nice enough to go ahead and check all those boxes for me. So they, oh, <laughs> they, that's they were like, cool. dude, you came this far. Just just get all the stuff, yeah? So I got, I mean, everything. Cover, mag wheels, stainless steel, everything. Uh, <laughs> it, was, it was a great experience, and it's one of my favorite things I own. It's sitting right here in my backyard. <laughs> well, that's awesome. Uh, they, they are great people. Uh, they are always have been stellar to us uh, like i said doing business with them and i've actually been looking at the new uh, i'm sure if you were there you've seen the chicken flippers they have uh-huh uh, yeah load them down and flip them they got that new hog roaster uh, i think it's like three foot long and you can uh, use you know, it, I haven't, it i haven't seen their website in so long maybe i should go back and check it out yeah this thing's like 20 i think it's 2500 bucks and i have not told my wife yes uh, 500 that. was not 2500 bucks yeah oh <laughs> i know it was not it was uh, more, like have, more like a camry more like a toyota camry, camry. that's yeah. a good comparison yeah, yeah. I, I have some pits like that right now that are but i might have one to get close to a good used restored go, go park your southern pride in the yard for 50 years and see what happens and then go park my meadow creek in the yard for 100 years and see what happens that's right it'll that's mine'll exactly. still work that's right. It's true. You take away all the wires and stuff, it definitely changes things up. Yeah. Also, uh, I'm not uh, exactly known to be very good with electronics. <laughs> if it's got, if it's, if it's electronic, I will break it. And, so uh, when you were, when you were on the TV show and you were catering as an actor on the show, I'm sure you had other people helping you with that, but did you get to choose the food you were going to smoke on the pit for like the the cattle drive and all that, the big scene with you in the pit Absolutely. out there. Absolutely. I did. Um, it's part of the beauty of the relationship that Taylor Sheridan and I have, um, and the relationship that I have with our art department and the rest of our casting crew. Um, our, uh, our art director came to me, um, when they were going to do that big smoking scene and she goes, Hey, so, um, we're gonna do this scene that you're in, you know this, and I'm just wondering like, how would you have it all set up? And like, what would you be cooking? And she goes, actually, can you just design the whole, can you just tell me how you want it to look and I'll make sure it looks right and then you just cook whatever you want. And I was like, God, that's great to hear because it's so much easier this way. Yes. Um, so yeah, uh, the only request is like in the script, it was Gator Smoke's whole steer. And I was like, yeah, duh, I was all already going to do that. So, um, yeah, I got to choose all the stuff and that scene was one of my favorites to do. Cause it was one, I got a VIP front row seat to Laney Wilson concert for five days, which you can't beat that. No. Um, and Ryan Bingham obviously sang a bunch with her and I got to sit with, in one of my favorite places on the planet, right on the chief Joseph ranch in Darby next to my barbecue pit and all my stuff with a big Yeti full of Coors Banquets. It was good stuff, man. Like, what, Sounds like a good what, time. What can a, what can a redneck dream of better than that? You got um, that right. And I got to feed all these people and I, I had my team still running craft services down on the bottom of the hill and I would just call them and be like, hey man, bring me another uh, marine cooler full of meat. I'm, I'm gonna get low. And I cooked uh, for five days straight doing the barbecue, the branding scenes. And I fed wow. everybody that walked by real food. So uh, all background, all the all the crew that was right there in the middle, so they could just walk up whenever they wanted and eat. We don't need plates. It's Yellowstone. You just give up. here. Take this in your hand. There, there, we only have good germs up there. You know, it's dirty, but it's clean dirt. So we That's just. Right. It was a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful thing that that scene and the weather was great and people were dancing and having a good time and Ryan Bingham would come by me every once in a while and grab a, a real Coors banquet because they don't give them that on the on the, on the other side of the world. <laughs> yeah. So how was it working with uh, some of the bigger stars like uh, Kevin Costner and Ryan Bingham and Laney Wilson and all that? How, how was it working with all those guys? 
Well, I've obviously been around that world for a long time. I grew up, in my both my parents were in the film business, and I grew up in Southern California. So um, star tr Starstruck really isn't a thing. Um, every once in a while, you know, you, you're like, ooh, really excited to meet this person. But for the most part, it's just a job, man. And um, getting to work with the Yellowstone cast has been uh, a, tr a treat. Uh, everybody's been really great and helpful to me over the years um, and supportive, which is, you, I, I can't ask for anything cooler than that. Getting acting tips from Kevin Costner, I mean, that's, that's as good as it gets, dude. So it's been really, really nice. Everybody, everybody is really cool, and Yellowstone is very different than any other um, movie set environment. You don't get to be a diva, maybe Kelly Riley a little bit, but uh, <laughs> uh, but you don't really get to be a diva. We're all in the same boat here. We're all stuck in Montana. Not that that's a bad place to be, but we don't have a Starbucks and we don't have a Whole Foods and we don't have we don't have all that stuff. It, it, it puts you it puts everything in perspective when they're up there and it really unhollywoods people really well and god i love that <laughs> yeah i could, i could see that really uh being a um something taking people out of their regular environment and putting them into something like that where they can't get the normal things they're used to and having to adapt to that way of life it it is god is me so you better be nice <laughs> That's, that's and, and you do more than just Yellowstone talking about this whole, like you're doing the 18 or you've done the 1883 set and all of that as well. Only the right? ones that look incredibly difficult and dusty and are full of cowboys. Yes. Those are the ones I do. <laughs> those are the ones you do. I've actually, I've asked to uh, do some of the other shows before. Like I was a really big Tulsa King fan because uh, mm. I'm a Stallone fan. Yeah. And uh, Taylor, Taylor laughed at me. He said, Gator, what the hell would they need you out there for? They're in a city. And I said, well, I really like Tulsa, and it's right up the street from my house. And he goes, they don't need you over there. They're, they're in a city, dude. Why would you want to go to a city ever? <laughs> Fine. <laughs> Whatever you say, boss. So any Definitely yeah, anytime right. it looks like it was a really hard show and it was dusty and, and brutal, that'd be <laughs> Yeah. Nothing like <laughs> eating dust all day, right? Trying to cook yeah, and prep food, keep a table clean. <laughs> do it. Y'all all eating dust already. Here's some more. Uh, you just, and it, again, it's another reason that not everybody can do this job. Um, and, you know, power to all the chefs out there, you know, the, the culinary uh, aficionados and, and classically trained and restaurant chefs, power to them, but they would hate that. Uh, like dust blowing on your food while you're trying to prep it. That's not for everybody, man. That's that's a mindset that you gotta you gotta grow. You can't you don't just jump into that and be okay with it. And I've I've seen it a million times. I've hired I've hired professional chefs and restaurant chefs to come work for me, and it's just not it's not fun for them. You know, they need yeah. their they need their their control. They need their space. And when you're out there on the range, you, there is no control. You you just do what the weather says. Is it kind of almost like a if the guy rolls up and you hire somebody new and he comes out wearing a chef coat, you're like, yeah, he's not going to make it here. <laughs> I mean, that, that's that's if he's got the thermometer in his sleeve right here and an ink pen. Usually, he's just not as uh, versed outside in an outdoor kitchen versus being in all the stainless steel inside. Yeah, you better be in Wrang Wranglers and cowboy boots because you ain't going to make it otherwise. That's right. That's right. I like Wranglers and cowboy boots, but I do like hey dudes and shorts and flip flops too. Yeah, that's the other part of my crew. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of funny how people. both side, two sides of the world, right? Yeah, well, some of us have an image to maintain, but yeah, the rest of them are in hey dudes. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll laugh at them. I say, "You sure you good in those in those hey dudes, man? They look like they're a little slippery." No, no, I'm fine. I'm fine. All right, man. Whatever, whatever, redneck. <laughs> <laughs> That's it, for sure. So, <laughs> something I don't even have them wrote down here. I've got to ask, Ben's your name is Gator nickname. How did you get the name Gator? First off, and then rolling into, I want to know: Do you cook a good gumbo? That's what I want to know. Let's answer the elephant in the room question. I, I haven't had a gumbo better than mine in a while. Um, maybe a seafood gumbo down real deep in South Louisiana, maybe. 
But the last time I had gumbo better than mine was my grandmother's. So I'm, I'm up there for sure. I don't want to say I'm the best because there's, there's a few of us that still make gumbo, but I, I definitely make you not want to eat it anywhere else. So are you a chicken and sausage gumbo man or a seafood gumbo? Yeah, man? Bird and sausage, baby. Um, seafood, <laughs> I, I don't know. It's just never been my gumbo. I, I, I like make a seafood etouffee. I'll make a seafood stew. Um, but for gumbo, I don't know. Chicken and sausage, is, that's what I grew up on, I guess. That's what um, I want to. And I, and I don't like when people mix meat and seafood together. So you, a lot of times you'll get like a crab and sausage or a shrimp and sausage and, and I don't hate mixture. it, it's just not my thing. So uh, etouffee, that's for seafood. Uh, and then gumbo, uh, if, if you can get pheasant or quail or duck, uh, game birds are just so good in that gumbo. And um, yeah. I've done smoked turkey gumbo is really good. Uh, yeah, I like, I like my bird, bird and sausage, man. Yeah, we do a lot of duck gumbo at our duck club. Uh, now, if you can get a duck and alligator sausage gumbo going, now you're talking my language. You know, I've never put alligator sausage in the duck gumbo, but we have a friend that makes alligator sausage in Mississippi. And it it's in Walmart now. It's called really Country good. Pleasing. Oh, I know uh, it well. <laughs> yeah, he younger kid runs that for his dad down in South Mississippi. Uh, he's uh, right outside of Jackson. And if he you ever has, have a chance to stop in been there, a part of many of my gumbos over the years, I promise. <laughs> well, if you ever have a chance to stop in his facility there uh, below Jackson, if you're ever that way, please do. They're, they make sausages that they don't sell to the general public stores everywhere. That's yeah, just actually, in the store. I'm actually trying to go down there. Um, they're doing cruising the coast uh, down right there now. Right, now. right now. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm trying to make it. My, my, my aunt and uncle are out there right now. They're from Baton Rouge. And uh, they, they rented a place for the whole month of October. So I'm trying to make it down there to go see them. And maybe we can make that happen. I've got about, I bet a dozen friends that have carried cars down and are staying down for, you know, several weeks to cruise the coast. They, a bunch they're of serious them. about it, man. They ain't joking. Oh, they're very I, serious. They're, was, most of them are retired. If I, if I got some time, I was going to grab, just throw a bike in the truck and take a motorcycle down there and go cruise, you know? Yeah. Be real nice. Um, um, so Gator, the name Gator. Uh, I, again, I grew up in Southern California. I went to um, an untraditional public school in, in Los Angeles um, with some uh, p perhaps ne'er-do-well children. Uh, and I was always very different. I was always a country kid in a city and I, I never fit in. I fit in everywhere, but I never was at home in the city like that. Um, and I grew up coming to South Louisiana every summer and spent a lot of my childhood down there and we'd go alligator hunting and we'd go stay in the swamp and swim with, swim with gators and snakes and fish and hunt and gig frogs. And it was just, I would tell these stories to my peers and they would look at me like I was an alien, man. And uh, we did a, uh, a homecoming parade and we, we decorated all our cars for school and I dressed up, we, we went to an animal sciences magnet school in, in California. It was what, what we were all about over there. Uh, so we had a bunch of, you know, stuffed creatures on our cars to make them look cool. And I dressed up as Steve Irwin and uh, wrestled a big six and a half foot stuffed plush alligator in front of the whole school. Uh, and they started calling me Gator Gabe after that. And they never stopped calling me Gator Gabe. <laughs> wow. And it really went well. And I, I got in the movie business. And when I, I was doing a big show in New Orleans called Ender's Game, it was a big sci-fi movie that totally tanked. But uh, I would go into the office to do all the paperwork and stuff. It was when I was really starting to learn about, you know, the big, the big picture of my profession is, which is a lot of it's just paperwork, you know, a lot of it's just doing the, the no fun stuff. And I would go into the office and turn in all the receipts and time cards and stuff like that. And everybody in the office would um, always say, oh, hey, Gator, or bye, Gator, we'll see you later. And one day towards the end of the job, I said, now, how come you always call me Gator, man? And it, it was my email address. And uh, the 
the, the coordinator of the office goes, well, that's your name, isn't it? And I said, well, you're damn right that's my name. And I never went by my, my given name ever again. I went by Gator um, after that. And I did my first show by myself after, right, just a couple weeks after that. And I, I walked onto set and some goofy assistant director walked up to me and uh, they were all bright eyed and bushy tailed. They said, hey, uh, are, are you our craft service guy? What's your name? I said, well, my name's Gator. And they said, well, hell yeah, Gator. Welcome to the show. And uh, that was it, man. The rest was history. And, and people, it's fun to say, people like, people would yell it out across the movie set or, or say it while they shoved food in their face. And it's, it, I think it's a huge part of what I, what I am now is, is my name. So being a cook and talking about that, and you just said something about food kind of hits home with me. Do you get that warm kind of fuzzy feeling inside when somebody takes the first bite of food, you just handed them off the pit or something you cooked and they, they tell you it's some of the best they've ever had and you watch their eye rolls and they're, you know, just shaking their head. How do you feel when somebody, you know, says that to you standing there eating some of your food? That's the only thing that matters. Um, that's everything. Um, I like watching people eat more than cooking. Uh, I watch, I like watching people enjoy food again. I think it's, I think it's, unfortunately it's, it's lost a lot is, is that food should be a celebration of life and, um, that food doesn't have to be boring or healthy all the time or really, really good for you. It just has to be good for your soul, man. And, um, if I can get somebody to, you know, to have a moment with, with a meal, that's, that's, that's the fuel for me. That's the, that's what gets me going. And, and that's what helps me to be able to do these hard jobs and, and continue doing them at 18 hours a day and through the night. Or when you, you bring a, a hot pot of etouffee up to a cold and hungry film crew at two, one in the morning on the side of a mountain and everybody just, you can feel relief from everyone that they're going to be okay. And, um, one of the things that really gets me is uh, I've been very fortunate enough to run into people over the years that, um, well, I, I hear this one all the time, that's better than my mama's. And I said, well, don't tell her that uh, <laughs> because I don't, I don't want to get in trouble. Uh, but when somebody says, where'd you get this recipe from? Oh, uh, I just made it up. Uh, you know, I, it's something that I just know how to make. And they're like, this tastes like... I'm eating in my mother's, my grandmother's kitchen or my mother's kitchen. And it, man, you want to get me, you want to get some waterworks going. You, you got me. I'm, I'll start tearing up. Cause that, that's beautiful to me, you know? And that's, that's what it, I wish I could get that because I, I don't. Yeah. I, I know the feeling on that. It's uh, uh, I, I wish I could say that more often and say, wow, this tastes like my grandmother cooked it. And I, I think I know two people that maybe I could have experienced that and, they're both my aunties. <laughs> yeah, I don't um, – my grandmother's passed, and my mom don't really cook anymore. Her health has gotten bad, and it's it's uh, sad to say that some days all the food that I cook, I would just love to have a, a country meal, fresh peas out of the garden, fresh corn, cut off the husk, make cream corn. I used to sit around with my grandmother and watch her do that in the yard and then go in the house and cook. A, a meal and I would give anything any amount of money whatever uh, to have one more meal uh, that she cooked man I had some good ones buddy I tell you what <laughs> I know I overate whenever I'd go to my, my mama's house I, I'd always make sure to help her clear out the freezer <laughs> and by the time I'd leave town we'd, we'd make space for the next season of, of cooking because she always you know saved all the leftovers and boy it was like uh it was like roulette, but you won every spin. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. So I, I want to ask, so you, I mean, it's a job for you, but it's also your passion. But do you, do you cook for yourself? Do you find yourself like putting all of that into for you to eat or just for others? Every once in a while, uh, I'll make myself a real nice dinner. I almost made gumbo yesterday. It was so nice out. But uh, no, I, you know, without, without the gang... I save it for them, you know. I, I, I'll, I need that. I need this part of my cooking style. I need the, I need the companionship. I need a crowd. I need an audience. 
Uh, I mean, I could do it for myself, but for who? For me? I don't need that. I'm just, I'll make it. I'll make a steak for me and my dog. You know. <laughs> well, I know how that is. I I've got to ask this: When you make gumbo, is it a must that you must do potato salad as well? There's no musts anywhere. Um, I think that to put constraints on any anything that I do would be a shame. Um, and we, by the way, are anti-potato salad. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and look, I love potato salad, and my favorite potato salad recipe is in that book right next to you. But uh, that's not the way we grew up. That's a New Orleans thing. Um, maybe a little bit Baton Rouge, but Lafayette, we would never put potato salad in our gumbo, only rice. Well, see, and I never ate it with, with gumbo either. Never until probably the last five or six years of being at certain events or, well, or seeing pop, people it's the come popular on. Way, but those, new, yeah. those city folks from New Orleans know how to popularize stuff. <laughs> that's it. That's, that's uh, about like I saying. Gumbo, fried egg. That's my favorite. Gumbo for breakfast with a fried egg. Hmm. Actually, anything with a fried egg. <laughs> I think I'm that's a test first, though. We love fried eggs, man. I'm a fried egg person myself. She's a scrambled egg person. I always want a sunny side up. Yeah, over easy in the gumbo. That's it. Well, we do not want to take any more of your valuable time. Yeah, you got a five-minute warning, my friends. I know. <laughs> well, I, I don't want to take any more of your time up. It's been a pleasure chatting with you, Gator. Uh, thank you for coming on the show. Uh, I know your book is going to do awesome. I know I we can't wait. I'm going to definitely pick some recipes out and cook some. For some holiday YouTube videos Make coming the potato up. potato salad. You'll really like it. I'll try the potato salad, but I'm definitely going to use that dessert uh, recipe, and we're going to do it on the smoker for Thanksgiving or Christmas coming up for a YouTube video. Yeah, I think the bread puddings would do well in the smoker, too. Yeah. That pineapple one really, we wrote it down. I didn't hit that a while ago. She she wrote it down. But sounds that, delicious. That sounds really good. I'm a pineapple fan and anything. Well, it's pudding. my recipe because there's a whole cup of bourbon in there. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. What is your preferred bourbon, by the way? Uh, me, I like, I, I'm a Pendleton guy. I've been drinking Pendleton for years. That's what I like. But um, I'll use whatever. As long as it's American, we're good. <laughs> That's right. Well, as Tell everybody where brown, they can find As long as it's brown and made in America, I'm in. <laughs> Nothing wrong with that. We're heading to the Jack Daniels next week, actually. So it should, uh, I'm sure we're going to have some of that good brown water. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, man, I sure appreciate you guys having me. And uh, I look forward to talking with you guys more. Um, and if I can make it out your way anytime, uh, we're, let's try and set something up. I'd, I'd sure love to come see your new place and eat some good food. And we'll make some recipes and drink some we of that will. brown water yes. we were talking about. <laughs> well, we'll be in touch, and I'm sure we can make that happen. Gator, thank you for coming on. And uh, if anybody's trying to find you online, you, do you have any kind of socials you want to plug? Uh, you can, uh, we, we, we're we heavy on the Instagram. Uh, we're, we're building up our TikTok right now, but I'm a little old for that, but we're going to do it anyways. <laughs> um, and then we're on uh, we're on Twitter and Facebook and all that. But, yeah, you catch me on Instagram. Uh, it's just under Gator Gabe. All right, Gator Sounds Gabe. Sounds good. That'll work. Well, Gator, thank you for coming on. Uh, once again, and uh, I wish you nothing but success. And it's always great to see another fellow cook uh, doing what he loves. Thank you for tuning in to the Shooting the Cue podcast. If you have any comments or suggestions for future episodes, please feel free to reach out to us on our social media channels or through our website. Don't forget to subscribe to our podcast on your favorite platform. Leave us a review if you enjoyed the show. Until next time, keep shooting the cue.